Access Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Access Manchester. The Access Manchester Long Player. An iconic album in fall with Jim Salverson. Access Manchester. Hello, how are you doing? I'm Jim and welcome to another Excess Long Player where I deep dive on a classic album with one of the people, or in this case, two of the people that made that album. Today, a classic album of the Britpop era as I talk to Sonia Madden and Glenn Johansson from Echo Belly, a band that consider amongst their fans the likes of Stephen Patrick Morrissey and Madonna, as you'll hear in today's conversation. For this podcast, we're going to focus on the band's second album, On, the follow-up to Everyone's Got One and the album that contains massive tunes like King of the Curb, Great Things, Dark Therapy, and it's just a top album from the Britpop era. So let's go right the way back to 1995 and get stuck into this one. Sonia and Glenn from Echo Belly talking about On. How are you doing, guys? Yeah, good, thank you. Very well, thank you. And you? Yeah, very good, thanks. Lovely to speak to you. And whilst I was pulling the stuff together for this interview today, it suddenly occurred to me it was a, it was kind of a little bit strange to jump in on a second album rather than a debut because it feels like we're joining almost midway through the story. That said, I really like On as an album, so it's the one I wanted to focus on. But rather than completely skipping yeah. over the formative years of how you met in a pub, how you formed a band, all that kind of thing, I wanted to touch on one particular element of that that I've heard you talking about before, Son, you know, in that when the debut album came out, your parents were really unimpressed that you were going to take a life as the, the front person of a rock band, that you were going to be in these creative arts. By the time this second album came out, so by the time On was released, had your parents changed their view at all on whether they thought that was a wise career choice? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think um, it was only when my dad saw an article in the Times of India that he actually raised an eyebrow and said, oh, okay, that's what you do. Okay, well, it was your second album. You've just come off the back of a top 10 album, which your debut was. What was the mood in the camp like at that stage then? Set the scene. You've got your debut album out there. You've got an inkling that this is kind of going to work. This is going to be yeah, successful. I think it was a real buzz because... You know when you feel like you're actually riding a wave and you're part of something and you, you're just kind of going with this rush, with this flow, and you're young and you're excited and everything's just laid out in front of you. It was a real time of possibilities. I think that's something that comes across in the sound of the album as well, actually, that kind of optimism, which was very in keeping with the music of the time. I, I want to go onto that in a little bit, but... In terms of this being the second album, it's a cliche, the difficult second album, but it's a cliche because a lot of the time it's true and there's a huge change between when you're working on a debut and you're spending five, six, seven years collating music to go into one record compared to the second album where suddenly you're on a tour bus, you're finding five minutes here and there to work on songs. How did that change the dynamic of the band in terms of the writing of this album? You're right. It was, uh, most of it was probably written whilst we were touring uh, Ego. Oh, everyone's got one. So I remember sitting on in the back of the tour bus before sound checks or after sound checks, playing around with ideas and uh, we usually used to try out in sound checks. And uh, I think most of the album came together that way, actually. So there wasn't much, as you said, we didn't have that much time in advance to prepare for it. It was just straight in there, straight into the rehearsal room, straight into the studio, basically. So it was happened really quickly. The songs were really fresh and really exciting. In terms of the process, did it change at all? Because I remember, well, I was looking back at an interview that you did around the writing of this album and it was you, Sonia, you, you were talking to a journalist and you were saying, we're working on the second album. And then you corrected yourself and went, well, I'm not working on the second album. Glenn's writing for the second album. And now I'm going to kind of do the lyrics and the words later. Was that how the first album came together? Was it very much melodies and songs first and then you kind of layer the words over the top? I always, apart from one song, have written the lyrics to the music that Glenn gives me and I let it show a kind of film in my mind and then the story just comes out. The only one I actually wrote before was uh, Bulldog Baby, which I'd written as a poem, and I gave it to Glenn and he put the music behind it. So there was a shift between 
the first album and the second album you kind of mentioned it was a bit more bright and a bit more optimistic i think musically it was maybe slightly less punk and less garage this second album than the first album which is maybe more in keeping with the brick pop sound if you like was that what was making that change was it the influences of the bands around you that were kind of maybe pushing you more in that direction i don't know not necessarily like a specific bands as such perhaps but uh it was kind of in the air, if you know what I mean. And uh, I guess you subliminally were influenced by that, perhaps. Um, but before the first album, you had so much more time. You had perhaps several years of collecting material, you know. This time we didn't, so we kind of went straight in. And um, I think, yeah, that influenced, influenced a little bit the type of music as well. But we did have American producers, though, so which was a little bit odd. I think we're just looking at the artwork and uh, bringing back memories because a lot of the photos are from the first tours that we did before. And you can tell the kind of climate we were trying to write the songs for on. Right. Because the photos actually belong to the tour before, the album before. Did that kind of create a more, I guess you kind of like, one one side that's going to be pressurised because you know you've got, a very limited window in which to be creative in and, mm. and being creative never works very well when you've got time pressures right it's like it's no, the most difficult no, no. it's actually the opposite i thought i agree actually. really because, yeah because okay. we we're kind of so it, it, within it all and and it was kind of kind of inspiring you were just going with the flow you know you you were um, constantly working constantly writing you know gigging and stuff so it was actually I think it helped, uh, made it easy to write songs, actually. I think uh, if you I... tell any artist you've got forever, you're going to procrastinate. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're told, right, you're in the yeah. studio at the end of the year, get on with it, you, you, you do it. Lyrically, there was a bit of a shift on this album as well. And you said in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, this was an album that you wanted to challenge yourself on song. You wanted to push yourself a little bit further lyrically than you had done in the first album. What did you mean by that and when you listen back to the album now do you hear particular moments where you're going okay that's me pushing myself lyrically and creatively i suppose so but you know to tell you the truth sometimes you just say things as sound bites um and the <laughs> truth is that you're always trying to push yourself you're, you're always trying to rediscover you know what's hidden inside you and i think it wouldn't just apply for on <laughs> it it is something I, i've always done otherwise i'd get bored I mean, there was a change in terms of the topic, as far as I can hear, listen to it. And I think that first album, you tackled two of the things that made you stand out within the Britpop scene. The fact that A, you're a woman, B, you're a British Asian, which are two rarities, still oh, yeah. rarities in music now, actually, which is really? weird. But yeah, particularly in the 90s, it kind of really made you stand out as an act. And you tackled those on the first album. There was songs that kind of referenced sexism and racism that you dealt with in the past but those topics maybe weren't as much in the forefront on the second album i felt was that a kind of conscious thing to kind of move on from those narratives uh, no it wasn't a conscious thing um it was more a case of when i listen to a piece of music it, it tells me what it wants to say without okay. sounding too pretentious it's almost like I, I don't want to force an agenda onto certain things you know, as a as a writer, it's, it's it's almost like peering into something that already exists and extricating the story from it. So every time I, I got a piece of music from Glenn, it would tell me this is the vibe, this is the theme, and then I would find a subject matter within it. So it wasn't like I had some political agenda. It came from an an honest need to find out the answers about that subject for myself, and perhaps I didn't have anyone. When I was growing up, I loved pop music, but I didn't have anyone talking to me about my problems growing up. So it was almost like lyrical exorcism for the first album. So was it kind of like literally when you get your music from Glenn, is it literally a, yeah. a blank sheet of paper where you're, you're waiting for the inspiration almost? Or do you have like a, a smorgasbord of topics that you want to tackle or things that you want to mention? No. Like a literally blank no, sheet of paper? No. That's too pedestrian for me. I, I like to think of myself more as a, a channel for a story. It's more exciting that way. Yeah. And from your point of view, Glenn, mm -hmm. when you hand over music for yeah. the, 
lyrics to be layered on top. Do you have ideas of where you wanted to go at that stage, or are you kind of just willingly giving it and waiting willingly to see what happens? Willingly giving it away to sign up to Bonnet. <laughs> yeah, I, I have very little. I rarely have any kind of request. No, I don't. I don't. I, I leave it up to Sonia 100%. I mean, who am I to? Ben is, a, ben is very <laughs> practical, though. If I write something... I don't even know our lyrics, to be honest with you. Some three. Some three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but, well... <laughs> <laughs> so, no, basically, I, I have no input in lyrics whatsoever. Yeah, mind you, when she showed me some lyrics, and, uh, you know, I might have an opinion, and uh, but uh, not before, no. I want to take you back to 1995 now, and an interview, Sonia, you did with mm-hmm. Beat... I don't know if you remember this, and it was concerning a certain Stephen Patrick Morrissey. Morrissey. <laughs> He's been to see you a few times. He came to see the band in Coventry. Were you aware that he was in the audience when you were actually on stage? Yes, because he came backstage before the gig and had a nice chit-chat with us. What about the prospect of supporting him on tour? Is it in this country or in America? Is that going to happen? It's only three shows. I mean, everyone's making a big fuss of it, and we're, we are grateful and we're very happy to be doing it. It's brilliant, but it's only three shows, so let's not blow it out of proportion. Morrissey was one of your celebrity fans. There was R.E.M. and Madonna. Madonna tried to sign you, who were also counted as fans of your work. But in your reaction there, you were fairly blasé about it, I'd say. Was that you doing the, I know, we're a cool rock band vibe thing, putting on a bit of an act, and inside you were just super excited about that? Or was it just, did it just feel like par for the course at you at that stage, that of course, you're brilliant, you're going to have these guys that really like your music? I'll tell you the truth, it was neither of those. I, I w- was quite naive when it came to a lot of the cool bands that came before me. Glenn was a huge Smiths fan, and he said that was the reason why he came to England he fell in love with their music. But I was a bit of an ignoramus. I would know more about Baudelaire than I would about Morrissey. And I genuinely was not a fan. It's not that I was not a fan. It was that I didn't really have access to a lot of the pop culture in the same way as a lot of contemporaries. So I didn't realise the importance of Morrissey's lyrics until... Glenn basically educated me. So um, it was more a sense of naiveness. I mean, he came round to my flat and there I was in my slippers and uh, asked us if you'd like to go on tour. And I never knew him that well. So I didn't actually let him in because I just saw this guy standing outside my front door and looked out the window and I I, I don't know who you are, you know. So I, I think they, him and his friend, they knocked on the door three times. And as they were leaving... I saw his face and recognised him and then opened the door. And we had a, a feral cat, a black cat. Glenn had named Morrissey. And, of course, there's Morrissey meeting who I thought was Morrissey. Was You know, the cat was more Morrissey <laughs> than Morrissey. And it was interesting because you couldn't touch that cat. He, he was scratchy. He liked him. He actually allowed him to, wow. you know. Yeah, so there was definitely some sort of little spiritual thing going on there. It was just... Um, it was just naive of me. I, I, I just didn't appreciate, you know, it in context. So I guess in that case, Claire, if you're the Smiths fan, you must have been more excited by the fact that Morrissey rocks up to your dressing room in Coventry and then invites you on a tour of the US. Yeah, I, it, it was. But it was a bit surreal almost, you know. The funny thing is, once you're kind of right in it, so to speak, um, as I said earlier, you're kind of riding your wave, everything's going well. You get a little bit blasé about these things, you know. You, um, you, you don't uh, don't really value it the moment as, as you do perhaps as I perhaps do now. So at the time, it wasn't actually that big a deal, you know. Even though for me, it should have been really. It, you were kind of a little bit full of yourself, perhaps, you know. Very often, you met people that I said, I wish I'd talked to them, you know, but you just couldn't be asked, you know. It's, it's not funny. that you can't be asked. You're, you're actually, when you're young, you're kind of stupid. You know, there's a kind of young and dumb and it's, youth is wasted on you. I lived in Soho, North North Soho, and there was a music agency below the flat where I lived. And um, when Glenn moved in, someone came and knocked on the door asking for, to borrow some sugar. And it was one of Glenn's childhood heroes. And, you know, he, he just, he didn't even say anything. He just gave him the sugar in a sort of dumb Swedish way. And, and, and then afterwards, oh, my God, you know, it's like at the time, you, you, 
sometimes you're just too um, lobotomized to actually say, I love your music or I, I really appreciate or you were an important part of me growing up or something, you know. The really the same way we, we did a couple of shows with David Bowie yeah? and when we kind of spoke to him afterwards, went into his dressing room and stuff. And at the time, it was no big deal, you know. It just, in retrospect, you think, wow. And even when it is a big deal, you feel very self-conscious. It's like, well, what are you going to say? I love you. You know, it's, it's just like, it's like, what role am I playing here? I'm an artist. I want to show appreciation. But as an artist, you also know that if a fan comes up to you, there's a kind of invisible wall that then comes up. So you don't want to play the role of a fan, but you want them to know just what they meant to you. So there's all these things going on in your mind and you're trying desperately to be cool and you're making a fool of yourself at the same time. So it's all that interplay. You know. I want to dig a little bit deeper into that relationship with other bands because I think within the Britpop era, which is ironic for a period of time that kind of sparked the whole or was going to go on and spark the whole girl power thing. There was supposedly a bit of a rivalry between yourselves, a Republica, and Sleeper, who were loved together in kind of this, here's a load of female artists, so we're going to create a narrative around them where they all hate each other. Was there any kind of rivalry between the bands, or was that a complete fallacy of the press at the time? Um, there was a bit of rivalry, to be honest, and it was definitely fanned by the press you know agenda of, of having stories um but saying it politely i i didn't actually rate any of them enough to think of them as competition right. and i don't mean that to sound as it does but i just mean it i wasn't paying as much attention to them and it it was more a case of just really being involved in what we were doing anytime you hear of rivalry it's usually written by a journalist there wasn't any real rival i want to you guys to pick a couple of highlights off the album in a moment, if you can. So they could be songs on the album, it could be moments you remember from the recording. But first, I want to talk about a couple of tracks. One of them is Great Things, which is your highest chart and single as a band. And as I said earlier, it was a song that kind of felt like it summed up that period of time. There was an, a feeling of positivity and hope and creativity and this idea that whoever you are, you can do anything or be anything. Was that a representation, that song, of where the band were at that stage and your kind of optimism about what the future held? You know, we could lie and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we really thought about it, <laughs> capture the moment, the gestalt of Britpop, blah, blah, blah. But really, it was one of the last songs to be written, one of the quickest songs to yeah. be written, and didn't really think about it that much. It was an afterthought, basically, that song. To the end of the session, uh, just brought this uh, thing in, you know, Sonar wrote the words really quickly. And it sounded good to be included on the album and, you know, did rather well. Didn't expect that. As a result of that, is, is it one of the songs that you're maybe more detached from? I, I think this happens quite often where bands and their biggest radio hits are the ones they kind of dislike a little bit. A, because they get to play them a lot and they're constantly talking about them. But B, because often the radio stuff isn't the stuff that's creatively as imaginative as maybe the other songs they have on the albums. That, that's exactly it, yeah. <laughs> we're very happy that it did very well but um there's a you know i wouldn't put it on the top of my list of songs we do. the other track i wanted to mention quickly was bellyache um and it's a song i'd actually forgotten about till i went back and listened to the album all the way through and was kind of paying a bit more attention maybe than i did back in the 90s and i thought this is a song that it almost feels like it doesn't belong on that album. It feels very different. It's kind of a little bit raw. It feels like musically it's doing something different. I just wanted to, to kind of get, I haven't got a question as such about it. I just wanted to get your thoughts as to why it was there and whether it felt like it was something that kind of maybe stood out. On it was the first songs. thing we ever did. I think uh, one of the first things me and Sonia ever wrote together. I remember Sonia had a little four track cassette recorder in a flat in Soho and uh, recorded it there i remember yeah i think it was probably the first song we kind of wrote together as echo belly i suppose it's the first pop song to start uh, with the word impotence well, there you go good fuck <laughs> <laughs> so if you could pick a couple of moments of the album what would be your highlights i guess it makes sense obviously two of you here if you pick a, a moment or a highlight or a musical section or whatever it is you want each that uh, brings back a particular memory Personally, for me, I mean, I what I enjoyed most was the mixing process of the album because uh, we had two American producers, Sean Slade and Paul Coldrick, 
Um, I think it came through our management. He suggested that at the time. They did Radiohead Bent, I think. And anyway, so I went back with those two guys to a studio called Fort Apache in Boston. And Fort Apache was kind of home to people like, I don't know, Belly, uh, Pixies, and a lot of stuff. And uh, spent two weeks sitting on the sofa, smoking weed, and listening to them, uh, it's in the album, so so that was one of the highlights of the album for me. Yeah. Didn't have to do anything for recorder, and it sounded great, you know. So I just really enjoyed sitting there listening to it. That that was brilliant for me, actually. A lot of bands talk about the difficulty in that process in terms of recording and mixing of capturing the mm. kind of live sound you had. And again, like you go back to your early stuff, and it was very punky, very garage. It had that kind of live fuzz to it. Was there? much difficulty in kind of capturing that and getting that live vibe on the second album? No, not really. Uh, it was recorded in a place called Conk Studios in North London. It's the, on by the King side. Um, so we basically recorded everything live. Uh, it was kind of pre-computers as well, so we were recording on tape, obviously, so uh, no click tracks or anything like that. So it was just very much like a live feel. We was trying to, to get the basic of the tracks done that way. But besides, we were just... It came off long, long tour, so we were really, we were really gelling as a band. So it was a, an enjoyable process and a, a quite an easy one as well. Sonia, what would you pick as your musical memory or highlight from the album? Studios for me tend to be a bit of a blur, but I, I, re- I remember Dark Therapy, that the inspiration was basically um, when we moved out the Soho flat, we moved into a place just off Hyde Park in uh, Lancaster Gate. And uh, it was a one-bedroom flat, and there were four of us living there, uh, a dog and two cats. Wow. So it, it was, it was, was that just, Morrissey the cat? Yeah, Morrissey was one of them. And Good. then we got another one. And then there was a little dog who was petrified of the cats. They terrorised the poor thing. And uh, a guy called Jason had come over from America, uh, Canada, actually, and um, had run away from home when he was 15 and lived on the streets in San Francisco, and then he made his way to London and became friends with us. And he, let's put it this way, he was heavily into experimenting and he was heavily into drugs. And I was a complete naive Indian girl, you know, just li- having a great time living in London. And one day he called me into the bathroom and he injected heroin. And I watched him do this a total voyeuristic experience. And I wrote Dark Therapy about that whole experience so you know dark therapy because always my favorite song but it is a song about him and um, my personal experience with one of my best friends and what he was up to i want to move on to the promo for this album what kind of came immediately afterwards and the health issues you suffered we had to cut the world tour short and go and get some um what's the word i'm looking for Me- medical health therapy whatever it is do you look back on that moment of the tour being cut short and think, what might have been? Is there anything in your head going, well, that kind of stifles the potential success this album had, even though it was very successful? Um, I think when you're ill, you don't think about much else. And I felt like, you know, I'd lie on the bed and my heart was beating so fast that I thought I was going to have a heart attack. It was also at a time when that upward trajectory of the band was kind of, you know, you were seeing the slope at the other end. And all the the beauty of Britpop was kind of decaying. So it was everything, you know, it was was rock and roll at its finest and and at its worst. So at least we experienced it. (laughs) Yeah. When you look back on this album now, 27 years on from its release, how do you feel about it when you look back? I know you did a re-release recently and you dug out photos and live songs and demos. When you look back, does it feel like you were part of something amazing, like you just said? Or do you look back on it and kind of go, oh, I wish we'd done this, or I wish we'd done this, or this could have been a little bit different? How do you feel about it? We are both, really. You know, there's a lot of things you could have done differently. Hell of a lot, in fact. But at the same time, it, it, it was great, especially since the release, when we released on... Then the touring really kicked in, uh, and we were we were on the road for for a year probably, you know, and it was really hard, but but really enjoyable at the same time. Really, really great moment in your life to look back on. 
Sonia, Glenn, absolute pleasure to speak to you about a classic album. Thank you very much for your time. Right, Obviously, awesome. Echo Belly is still a thing. You're still working. What, what's going on now? What's the, the latest on the, uh, the Echo Belly agenda? Well, we just recently, uh, yesterday, finished off uh, demoing four songs for an EP for a possible label. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, just finished yesterday, basically. So um, hopefully a release cool. in the autumn of some new material. That's well, the idea. we look forward to hearing it. If, when, as it comes. But Thank thanks you. very much for your time on the Excess Long Player. Pleasure. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. Thank you. The Excess Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester. That's it for today's Excess Long Player. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed listening to Glenn and Sonia reminiscing about the making of this classic album, don't forget to check out the album. Listen to it in full. I bet you've not done that in ages. The links you need are in the podcast description. Also, if you want more from this series, there's loads of other episodes talking about loads of other classic albums. Have a look at some of the episodes that have come so far. If Britpop is your thing, there's loads of albums dug deep into from that era, including Oasis, definitely maybe, Shed 7, Maximum High, Dodgy, Free Piece Suite, and a load more as well. Go and see what takes your fancy and have a look there and make sure you've clicked like and subscribe so next time there is a deep dive on a classic album, you get it straight away. The Excess Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester.